computer. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for being in this room. Thank you for being our guide. Thank you for being our God. Uh, we don't we don't take this for granted, the fact that you're here with us, where two or more are gathered. I pray that all the things would work today to where uh, the Holy Spirit would truly teach us. Uh, that's it. We, I really don't have, I don't really have another desire other than that today, that these people would be rewarded with the fruit of what the Holy Spirit, what you would teach us today. So Lord, I, I give you my voice, I give you my, my preparation, my study, my notes, uh, as an offering to you, kind of like a song. Uh, I pray that you would be glorified with what we do in the next 60 minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys, there are so many cool things that I want you guys to see today, but I'm <laughs> I'm going to do my best to translate that as best I can. I've got some things I'm going to write up on the board. I've got, you got your Bibles open, but I'm, I'm going to actually just, it's truly just say that again. I pray that you guys aren't asking yourself the question, what does Ben have for me today? I ask, I hope you're asking the question, what is, what do you have for me today? God, the Holy Spirit specifically, because he illuminates the scripture and, and creates a moment for us to have a revelation of truth. So let's go into chapter two. You guys remember last week, if you were here, you, you caught, caught us online the last tail end of chapter two, I deliberately didn't go into chapter three because I wanted to come back to chapter two, verse 42. 242. Have you guys ever heard of a church being an Acts 242 church? People go, hey, man, it's Acts 242, Acts 242. Entire doctrines have been built around this one singular verse. And at the end of last week, we were in the streets of Jerusalem seeing what happened right before then. We saw the Spirit descend upon the apostles, and an outbreak of crazy signs and miracles happened. To specifically wind, the sound, remember? The sound of wind. Not wind, but the sound of wind. That was an interesting thing. The second thing was tongues. We talked about tongues. What is it? Uh, what did it do? What was, it per what, was, what was its purpose? And then the consequence, as I I, I use the word consequence. What happened after that? So what we saw was a outbreak of miracles leading to the the conversion, well, Peter's sermon, to the conversion of 3,000 people being baptized into the church. So this is a kind of significant moment. Through baptism, they entered the church. And as Jews, if you remember, a very, very important piece of information I, I went through really fast, and I want to, I want to recap this. They, at, upon their baptism, became the remnant, the believing remnant, uh, some scholars would call it. But the believing remnant of Israel is a term I want you guys to remember. This is the same remnant that, I, that you will see in focus. Write this down, Romans 11, 5 through 7. I need you guys to go read that on your own time, but check that out when you got a moment. This is absolutely the same remnant that Paul is describing, this believing remnant. When they got baptized, they were renouncing their citizenship. Did you guys remember that? I Me mean, saying that, that was a very strange thing, perhaps, for you to actually have that historical context, but that is a very important detail in the story. So at the end of that scene people coming to Christ, we really need to see what happens next. And at the end of this scene, we find a summary statement of what followed for this group. Can somebody please read chapter 242 out loud, enough for my little microphone to pick you up. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Okay. Let's break this apart. In biblical literacy, it's very important not to just breeze over a text. And you remember, these, these original letters were never cut up into verses. You know, We just put verses on it so we can dichotomize and we can detail out exactly what Greek is being used. So this is an, I'm not going to take us to a big Greek, uh, a, a huge Greek lesson here, but I am going to ask you to turn on your, your open ears to a few little tricks, 
uh, when it comes to understanding what does the verse actually say in the Greek. So Acts 2.42, there's a very interesting couple things that we need to see. Well, first off, you can see that these people just put their trust in Jesus. Now they got to know more. They put their trust in Jesus. Now they got to know more. Trust in Jesus, got to know more. You see that? Isn't that the logical way of things when it comes to coming, hearing the gospel and, and coming to faith in Christ? You guys got to remember this. So, so we're seeing that in this text in 242, that those who came from Pentecost were continuously devoted to two activities. Can somebody tell me what the two activities that were first mentioned are? Baptism. Baptism. Breaking of bread. What else? Fellowship. There's one more. Teaching. There's one more. Prayer. <laughs> Prayer. There it is. So we see four things in view. And if you guys want to write these down in Acts 2.42, there is devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So teaching. And fellowship. Teaching. Fellowship. Teaching fellowship, then it leads to two lesser activities, which are breaking of bread, communion, and prayer. So if you guys wanted to write that out, it'd be the first two leading to the second two. This is the way the Greek is read. In the original Greek, you get a verb tense. You get a, like, like when you speak English, when you write English, you get a sense of the phrase, this in original Greek is saying the first two are more important than the second. Okay? Not, not less uh, powerful, just lesser. Okay? So very interesting. The Greek word for continuously. See the word continuously? Continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching is a very lar large Greek word, and it's about that long, and it's pronounced in English... Pros ketriejo. It's pretty weird to say in English, but it's Strong's G4342. Check it out sometimes on the blueletterbible.org. It's a great resource. It's free. But you will see this verse, that Greek word. Guys, do you know that Greek word is the exact same word used in Acts 10.7? Acts 10.7. I'll read it just for the sake of time. It says, when the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and devout soldiers of those who were his personal attendants. Pros krautriejo. The same word for personal attendants. Okay? Go back to verse 42, chapter 2. Exactly the same word. You know what this means in Greek? A vocational servanthood. Vocational servanthood. What's that mean? The, the believers of that day, when they put their faith in Christ, made it their job, their vocation, to take care of each other. That's their job. That is a very different definition than I wonder if you have walking into this class that you can see that used in Acts later in more times in the New Testament, that word, that Greek word, it means a vocational servanthood. So this personal attendance is a vocational dedication, you could even say, to something. I would wonder if you guys have a vocational dedication to anything. I'm not, I'm actually throwing myself under the bus. Do I, would I be willing, ask yourself this reflection question, this one's free, <laughs> Do you have a vocational dedication to anything? But then, do you have a vocational dedication to believers, to the church? Whoa, that's a pretty big question. So those who experienced Pentecost adopted a new lifestyle. Whatever just happened in chapter 1 and 2 led to a shift in their vocational dedication. So what would have what what is that that would change your personal dedication 
to then these two lesser activities that are mentioned in Acts 2.42. Which one are which one is it? Learning the apostles' teaching and spending time together. <laughs> The grammar in the Greek sentence makes clear that the latter two activities, the Lord's Supper and prayer, were conducted somewhat less frequently. That's an interesting concept, right? Oh, one more thing. One more thing. Check this out. The word for the Greek word for fellowship in Acts 2:42 is koine, uh, koinonia, which is a word for association. You ever hear that koinonia? We are experiencing koinonia inside of our ecclesia. These are all big words that I'm throwing out, but it's basically asking the question, Do I'm asking the question, do you guys understand what's going on when you go to church? Right here. This is, this is where it all comes from. Is associating yourself with the body of Christ is the natural outplay of placing your faith in Christ. Then, last thing. There is an article of the Greek word, oh, it's 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 actually it's like this. It's a Greek article for the word the that's right before the word prayer. Feminine verb, plural. What is that? Check this out. Let me read it for you. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to your Bible says to prayer. To the prayer is the actual translation. What does that mean? It means a formal setting of worship. Whoa. So the natural outplay of this body is mass gang of people placing their faith in Christ and having a new vocational dedication led them to do what? Just go willy-nilly? No, 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 no. They formalized a formal prayer service. Isn't that amazing? I, to me, that's kind of like freeing for me to understand the importance of worship and prayer services. Because I want to be like, oh, why do we even need that kind of stuff? Because it's important that we devote ourselves, apparently, to the fellowship, to natural outplay of the whole, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The, the fellowship of believers and the prayer and worship of God. Anytime God is experienced, what should be our natural response? In my opinion, worship, prayer. We should get together and celebrate. <laughs> That's just my personal opinion. So that makes sense on a practical level. The Jewish believer in the early church would have continued observing standard Jewish practices for prayers and meals, which occurred at prescribed intervals. You think you guys have a, ri a, a rigorous tradition for holidays? Ain't nothing if you're a Jewish uh, Israel, Israel citizen. you got exacting things that you have to do. But teaching and fellowship were continual and made a part of everyday life. It wasn't just Sunday. It wasn't just the Sabbath. Sorry, that's, that's actually small potatoes. I mean, we're barely, we barely even understand the rigorous life these people were living. Luke gave us this overview to help us understand the events of Pentecost better. Someone might have heard about the events of Pentecost, but then dismiss it entirely as an emotional response. Do you guys know what I'm saying? Have you ever seen an emotional response before and kind of scoffed at it? And seen it as like, oh, well, that can't be God. It's too emotional. It's too feely. Another word I've even had say that's too artsy. Well, I just want to give you guys a little food for thought. This is not a scene of mass delusion. This isn't, you know, people going crazy and smashing into walls and, and, and hitting glass over their head. No, this is not the scene that's being laid out by our author, Luke. This is... Glory, praise, adoration, shouts. Have you guys ever been in a prayer service like that? I have, and it's amazing. After the excitement had died down, these people would come to their senses and, and forget the whole experience if it was an emotional experience. Am I right? 
You guys ever had an emotional experience and then the next day you're kind of like disappointed? I grew up in a church like that. Every Sunday, altar calls, I'm down front, weeping, just tears. Go home that afternoon, and I'm like, hmm. I was sincere, guys. But could it be, I'm just putting this out there, that like we see in this experience, that they were sincere and sincerely right. That I was sincere, but sincerely wrong. So today we might see someone who makes a profession of faith, but within a fairly short period of time, they leave it all behind. Yes, I'm sure you guys have seen that. But the reality is that strong emotion responses are not an accurate measure of truth. People often experience strong emotions in response to a, a really strong message or a really strong event. But as sincere as the responses may be, they can be sincerely wrong. So Luke gives us evidence that this huge response on Pentecost wasn't a flash in the pan, y'all. Don't minimize this as just this, this really emotional jitter. Over 3,000 people came to faith on the first day of the church, and the change was followed by a vocational dedication shift. Now that's revival to me. Like, you want to talk about revival? Show me that. Show me the economic shift. Show me people selling their possessions. I'm talking to myself here. I'm not, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. Show me people who make their job out of taking care of people. That's the, the bond of the Spirit and the, the, the dedication that's mentioned in Acts 2.42. And the bond of the Spirit that drew this group together in new ways is in display right here. These people began to live, live their life and think differently, fundamentally differently, like I wouldn't even understand how to make that up kind of differently. As a result of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Guys, the Holy Spirit is the only way you're ever going to be able to see people and love them. Did you know that? Like you can love people as a non-believer, but you don't really understand what you're doing unless the Holy Spirit indwells and propels <laughs> you. It changed their views of Jesus. Doesn't the Holy Spirit do that? Which brought about salvation. And it changed their view of the world and each other and the church. And, and what am I supposed to do with you? And what am I supposed to do with her? And what am I supposed to do now? Which led them to think and act differently towards each other. You guys, I'm just telling you, Many have taken this Acts 2.42 and built an entire, entire church and established this doctrine of saying, well, we need a healthy church, so we need to do exactly what this is saying. Can I just give you guys a really quick little, little, little note that this is, this is a view, this is not supposed to uh, give us a church environment D, uh, blueprint? Nope. That's not it. It's actually supposed to give us an individual devotion blueprint. You see the difference? I hope you will after the, I'm done here. First, remember that the book of Acts is not intended as a manual for how to conduct church on a grand scale, and how to take over the world. We aren't supposed to mimic the first century. We're not supposed to just copy what we see here. So many people have done this. We're not supposed to, we're, we're not supposed to act like anything, even though the book's called Acts. We're not supposed to act like apostles. We're not supposed to act like the disciples. We're not supposed to act like the Jews. We're, not, we're supposed to follow Jesus. Following Jesus requires following the Spirit. Did you know we don't know how to follow Jesus without the Spirit? So, 
Our job is not to act like anybody. Our job is to follow a man, the, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. How do I do it? Holy Spirit. He gave us the way. Secondly, these activities are good and necessary disciplines of faithful believers, but they don't create faithful believers by themselves. What, what am I talking about? Fellowship, teaching, prayer, communion. Does that produce faith? It doesn't. It doesn't. They're an outward sign of a new heart and spirit. They did not produce those things, though. Isn't that what religion kind of is the, the ditch that you can go off into by thinking that if I do the behavior, I'll have the transformation? Isn't that convenient? So those outward signs of a new heart and spirit, they didn't produce those things. They followed those things. Think about that for a second. Like, I don't know if that's ringing a bell, but you get in the cart before the horse. So it must be the individual decision of a believer to become devoted to these disciplines as a matter of, I'll say it again, vocational dedication. Lifestyle. That's another word for it. Lifestyle. And I'm not talking about clothing or houses or anything like that. I'm talking about a shift in your want to. My dad used to say that. He'll change your want to. Well, how's your want to? <laughs> so it must be for your individual decision today of, as a believer to become devoted to these disciplines. But the activities themselves are still important. So let's not move on quite yet. Let's go to verse we're talking about teaching, fellowship, communion, and prayer. Those those four things. I hope you guys wrote them down. So, guys, can you read Acts 2, 43 through 47 for me? Nice and loud. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Mm. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, guys, finally, Luke provides another snapshot into the personal day-to-day -day life of what now? What's it look like now in the life of the early church? There was a feeling of what? It's that feeling that is mentioned in verse, the first verse. What is that? A feeling of awe. Oh. Everybody say awe. Oh. Awe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Or there's another word that's in the Greek. It's phobos, which is fear. Huh. And they witnessed the miracles as they witnessed the miracles that the apostles were endowed to produce and to do. They were get there was that sense of fear. What would happen if I was an apostle on that day and I was able to just perform a miracle upon my my own will? I'm telling you, you guys would be hitting the floor. You guys would be out of here. I mean, you guys wouldn't be like, oh, that's so nice. You guys would be shaking in your boots. And there'd be a lot of awe. <laughs> Maybe take you a while to get over it, you know? Throughout Acts, we'll hear of miracles happening in the early church, but notice that they, were, they are always performed by apostles or direct delegates of the apostles who received the laying on of hands. Now, guys, guys, I know I'm stepping on some toes, guys, because there's a... There's a whole lot buried underneath there. You know what I mean? Like modern day apostles. Is it a thing? Trust me. We're going to go over that. They are not performed by congregations in this text. Let's stay on the text. Are the congregation members performing these miracles? Nope. Nor could they have been handed down except by the apostles themselves. The gift of apostleship was unique in the early church. And after the last apostle died, the spiritual gift of miraculous powers, and I'm not a cessationalist, specific to the apostles. Can I say that one more time? 
specific to the apostles, endowed to the apostles for the spreading of the gospel in Asia Minor, Europe, Germany, I, the whole the whole world. When they died, they died. They didn't pass it on to their grandkids, and their grandkids passed it on to their lineage, and it led to apostles today. I'm sorry, that's just not biblical. This new church in Jerusalem was living close together, sharing all they had and helping the needy among them. What's going on when the miraculous powers ended? That continued. When the miraculous powers of the apostles were endowed, wow, we saw some amazing things, right? But at, at some point, they had to die, and they do die. And guys, we're going to go over, Acts actually tells us about a lot about what happened next, after the apostles died. But this new church DNA is now integrated into the Roman culture. Man, Rome really kind of had to look at that and kind of go, dang, we're kind of like, that's a utopiatarian thing that we've been trying to accomplish through the sword. We've been trying to make this happen through fear this way. How are you guys doing that? It had to raise some question marks. Why aren't you scared anymore? Why aren't you afraid of going hungry anymore? Why are you giving your land away? This unique church, this unique moment in the church, was unique in that time. Again, do not ascribe Acts 2.42 to today as a DNA for church environment blueprints, individual devotion blueprints. We also know from the epistles that Jerusalem was a poor church. They didn't have any money. It wasn't like everybody's just making it rain. And often they depended on the gifts of the wealthier Greek churches in the diaspora. In fact, Paul, a lot of times Paul, you'll see in the book of Acts, he's carrying money with him to Jerusalem to pay for everything. We also know that this is a very interesting thing for our application today. It's, it's not necessarily Jesus doesn't have enough money. It's that he will do what he wants to do with his church. It makes sense that these early poor believers in Jerusalem would have seen good reason to adopt communal living to help with their living situation. Don't you think? But here again, the unique experience of these believers in the first church should have been used as evidence, shouldn't be used as evidence for how other church bodies should operate. Please hear me out there. Am I saying it's bad? No. But are we supposed to emulate an act like this? No. We're supposed to follow the Spirit. For example, these early Christians also spoke Hebrew wore tunics and sandals, and they bathed once a month. Do you guys want to start <laughs> doing that now? I'm just saying, if we're going to take this serious, if someone wants to argue that all churches should operate like this church did, how far are they really willing to go to take on that campaign? I mean, take on that comparison, and you're going to find a lot <laughs> you're going to be met with a lot of challenges. So if we want to make useful comparison to the first century church, we should focus on making personal application to this book in its historical, literary, and biblical context. So number one, here's a couple, couple reflection questions that I'm going to be having at the end, but they make sense to write them down now if you can keep up. Otherwise, it's in the handout over here. Am I continually devoted to receiving God's word? Take a check for a second. That's what they were doing. Number two, are you spending time in fellowship with other believers? That's what they were doing. Remember, personal. Not We're not trying to build a church building, a church membership. You, believer. Are you participating with communion and prayer? The prayer? The praying. That guys, I mean, those are those are those are great. You're not going to fail here. It's not a quiz. This is just 
trying to get the point across how you doing in those three areas because that's what our that's what our the, our text today is pointing out as a result of their faithful dedication these people the early church to the lord and their open practice of their faith in the temple grounds and in the city they began to gain favor believe it or not we see this in the text it isn't necessarily coming from the pharisees as you'll see in the next chapter you will see the Greeks saying, whoa, you guys got something there. They gain favor first with God, more importantly. Then they gain favor with the people. Something I want to point out. First they gain with favor with God, and they're praising them, and he added more to their numbers, it says. Then... The Jewish people in the city and the early believers all were viewed favorably. That's an interesting thing. I think we always think that the world's going to hate us and they're going to think we're terrible and they're going to scoff us and crucify us. That's an interesting concept. If we're devoted vocationally to one another, truly through the Spirit and the bond of Christ, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it actually is a, a, a serving, attractional I hate that word, but it's it's a, a healing agent in the community. But obviously, they wouldn't have found favor from, uh, for very long because of the Pharisees. And in fact, Luke ends chapter 2 with this statement because he wants to set up a contrast with what's coming up next in chapter 3 with having to do with the Pharisees and the confrontation of the Jewish authorities when a miraculous healing breaks out. Somebody read chapter 3, verse 1 uh, through 10, please. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Mm. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement of what had happened to him. Okay, so our first crazy miracle after Pentecost. This is a what you put in the category of miraculous, right? It doesn't, doesn't happen very often. So let's take a look at what's going on. On one day in the life of the early church, just one day, the apostles went to the temple as they usually did. So now we're a couple of days, weeks, maybe, after the Pentecost event. And there was a crippled man from birth. He's sitting down in his usual space, place, by the gate that they called Beautiful, by the temple. I was actually able to walk there four years ago when I, on my trip to Israel. And it was awe-inspiring to see the geographical layout of, of where the pilgrimages of Yom Kippur would happen and actually stand upon the steps where this is taking place. This is insane to me. Um, but only Jews could go past the gate called Beautiful. Only Jews. And this man was placed here to beg for the thing we call alms. Financial gifts is another word for it. Given from one Jew to another for a specific reason. It's to demonstrate virtue. Alms weren't just money. It was, hey, you guys paying attention? I'm virtuous. It's, di it's different than just giving somebody money privately. They want something. So crippled, handicapped from birth, folks, blind, perhaps uh, wouldn't have been diseased. It would be people who were considered uh, cursed would be laying out upon the, the ground just waiting for people to go oh 
I'm going to give you my, my alms because people will see me do it. Crazy, right? Interesting. So here's another thing that's interesting about that, is that we learn that his condition is, he's had this condition for 40 years. Specific in the text, 40 years. Do you know what the word 40 is associated with in Scripture? This is a weird, crazy thing. I'm not a numerologist. I'm just saying the number 40, what's that ring a bell? What's that number associated with in just in your logic? What is that associated with? 40, anytime 40, 40 is no, number, that number 40 is used in Scripture. Judgment, right? 40 days, 40 nights. You fill it up. 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days in the ark, 40, you know, 40, 40, 40, 40. 40 is a number that's associated with testing and trial. So this man's condition seems to have been instituted by God as a test until the day when God would correct this situation through the apostles. And now we're reading about it today. Similar to the blind man in John 9. If you want to check that out, 40, very interesting. The beautiful gate was a gate between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women. Only Jews could pass through this gate, as I mentioned. And this man was placed there to beg for alms. This man is begging when he makes a request to Peter and John for this alms, these, this money. Rather than give him money, Peter, he says, <clears throat> look at me. <laughs> he says, look at me. That's an interesting thing. Hey, uh, hey you got a couple bucks? Look at me. Have you ever said that to a beggar on the street corner? I've never said that. Look at me. The man had probably been looking down, asking without making much effort to, to look up at all. In particular, you're never going to look at the giver. I mean, he's probably going like this. And he says, look at me. Can you guys picture it? So when Peter calls upon the man, he looks up eagerly, probably in anticipation for receiving a large sum of money. It's interesting to note that though Peter and the rest of the church had pooled all of their possessions, and Peter certainly could have showered the rain, man. Peter makes no effort to give this man any charity whatsoever that he requested. Meeting physical... Okay, so here's... Here's some crazy, crazy things to take, take into consideration that this text gave me and through my, my scholarship. Meeting physical or felt needs among unbelievers is not the ultimate aim of Christianity. I'm going to say that one more time. Meeting physical or felt needs among unbelievers is not the ultimate aim for Christianity. Nor is it the best expression of the gospel. Hang on. James actually instructs us. We just went through James, if you were with me. James instructs us to be generous with our giving in support, get this, of believers' physical needs. That's not something you hear preached very often, I bet. That's an interesting concept generosity you'll hear it behind the pulpit generosity generosity giving 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 but acts teaches us something very interesting that i want you never to move on from until you nailed this it teaches us to be generous with the message of the gospel to the unbelieving world generous with the message of the gospel to the unbelieving world Generous with meeting felt needs to the believing church. Generous with the gospel to the unbelieving world. In Peter's case, he says, I don't have much money, but I have an apostolic authority that I could grant you a miracle. In Peter's case, that's what he said. And Peter commands the man to walk. 
but he does so in the name of who? Jesus. So he evoked the name of Jesus, meaning, I don't do this in my own authority. I do it in the authority of the creator of the universe, Jesus. Peter knew he could produce he could produce this result because he was acting in accordance to the will and the direction of Jesus. The apostolic gift included the ability to perform such miracles. You, you're asking yourself, well, I've never had that. Yeah, exactly. You have not. And you probably won't. This was specific to Peter. I, I've had so many people ask me why they don't have this kind of power. And I say, because you won't. This is, this is not normative. This is, this is not prescriptive. This is descriptive. So he evoked the name of Jesus. But like any spiritual gift, the power resides with Christ. I want you to get that. Spiritual gifts reside within Christ, not you. You're not the magic gift giver and the wielder of gifts and Superman. I saw this on a, uh, on a meme the other day. There was an apostle, I'll leave his name out. He ripped his outer shirt off and he had a Superman t-shirt on. And he was he was preaching that modern day apostles, you are a modern day apostle and that you are a Superman. I mean, it was heresy. I mean, <laughs> crazy that you don't even understand how powerful you are. Let me just let me just warn anybody out there listening to me for such teachings. It's not our power. It's not our power to wield as we desire, like, like, a, like a sword. Man, doesn't that feel good as a man, especially you men hearing, hearing me? Boy, what, doesn't it just sound great to wheel, just whip out a sword and start slashing at your own discretion? There's something just barbaric about that that just sounds so great. I mean, maybe you ladies are, to your husbands, uh, wanting to slice and dice, but uh, uh, I'm telling you, we are not the ones with the authority. This distinction is important in the story because of what Peter says next to the crowd. After healing the man, he uh, just sits there. He just sits there, which makes sense since he has never walked before. So Peter reaches down and lifts him up, with him, and immediately he's walking. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. The result of the, mir the miracle is pretty strange. Pretty darn predictable, right? But people are amazed and praise God. It's like they're they're going, well, certainly if God is real, he's going to get up and walk. And he did. Before we look at what follows on this day, give a, give a moment of thought to how the same process works in every spiritual gift. Let's camp on this for a second. First, number one, the work is performed for the benefit of others. Spiritual gifts always will be work will work to perf and perform for the benefit of others spiritual gifts are given to the body to be edified building up equipping the saints others they are not for you brothers and sisters come on they are not for your own benefit they are to be used corporately. I'm sorry. If you're an introvert, God still loves you. <laughs> if you're an extrovert, God still loves you. He has a calling on your life. As soon as you gave your life to Christ, He endowed you with a spiritual gift that is to be specifically used in the corporate body of Christ. Secondly, number two, they are made possible only by God's power. And guess what? When you do, He's glorified. That's it. That's the, that's the litmus test. If you perform all these amazing gifts, and you know, people call me, oh, Ben, you're so gifted with music and singing. Let me tell you, there's been moments where I've used my gift for me glory. Me, me, building up me. There's a big difference. So there's a litmus test for you. Your spiritual gift, does it come through the power of God? Does it allow you to do things that you don't know how to do? Remember Moses? Hated speaking in front of people. Became a, a, 
He became a leader, an orator. But does it lead you to glorify God? We must never turn our gifts into a platform to glorify ourselves, period. Number three, we must look for ways to redirect attention given to us back to God for the praise he deserves. I was a worship leader for 20 years. Let me tell you, I know a little bit about this topic. You get done with worship, you come down the sta stage and people are giving you high fives. You're leaving the service and they go, Ben, that was amazing. What do you say? I just, to this day, I say thank you. Because I don't have, to, you know, I don't want to go into it. But what I want to say is, all glory and honor and power to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Messiah. You know, I wish I could say that. Because that's what gifting, true gifting, will do. In this case, we see clearly why the apostles were gifted to produce this said miracle. In the earliest days of the church, God determined that such public displays of his power were essential to giving his messengers the credibility. Think about that. They had to have credibility to bring his message to the people. This would have also explained why apostolic powers ended when the last apostle ended. By the time the church and the gospel itself was firmly established and such displays were no longer needed, in fact, they would begin to distract from the message itself if allowed to continue. Think about that for a second. Look how distracted we are with just the 12 apostles in, the, in this, this book. We've created doctrines that are just cray-cray, as the kids say. <laughs> and we would be distracted. It's very interesting as we go through the book of Acts how this is serious, uh, a serious thing. Look at how Peter makes us makes use of this display to focus attention on the gospel, and then we're done, everybody. Verse 11. Please, somebody, 11 through 16. While they clung to Peter and John, all the people utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw, he saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified the servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life. Whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect help in the presence of all, of, of the presence of you all. Whew. But Peter, naturally, and John received the people's attention and amazement. They they they're the ones that just did this to them. And they flock to them in the same way that people flock to Jesus in his ministry. But these men redirect the crowd's attention from themselves to Jesus, who was the source. Let's look at the structure of Peter's second sermon. Peter's, this is his second sermon, guys, by the way. Number one, he acknowledged what caught their attention. Number two, he gives them the source of the power. And then three, Peter reminds the crowd that they previously totally responded incorrectly when they had Jesus right there in front of them. So let's look at that. <clears throat> the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, as mentioned in the work of glorifying the servant Jesus, his servant Jesus, using this phrase, the patriarch's names, was the way of saying the Abrahamic covenant in the Jewish culture. So in the Abrahamic covenant, he said, in other words, these events are a part of God's work to keep his promise made in the Abrahamic covenant. Like if I'm a Jew and I heard Peter say this, I would have been shocked. And the promise was fulfilled ultimately in the man they crucified. Peter uses the term servant to describe Jesus in the light of his suffering. The Jews knew of Isaiah's promise, uh, Isaiah's promise that the coming Messiah would be a suffering servant. Calling Jesus a servant implied that he was the one Isaiah was describing. 
That would have been offensive if you were a, a, an Orthodox Jew. Third, Peter reminds the crowd that they previously responded to the wrong, the wrong way to demonstrations of God's power through Christ. They just wanted a happy meal on the mountain. Remember that? They just wanted a miracle. They were hungry. They just wanted him to produce something for him. The Jews of the city were complicit in Jesus' death, demanding that Pilate kills Jesus and release the murderer. Do you guys remember that in Matthew 27, 25, they specifically asked Pilate to put Jesus' blood upon them and their children? That's pretty, that's pretty intense that they were willing to do that. Peter uses a variety of the names of Christ. Remember, see that, what Andre just read? Holy One, Righteous One, Prince of Life. All of these terms reinforce, reinforce Jesus as the Messiah, the Messiah as a deity. Number four, if you guys are keeping notes, I did one, two, and three. What's the fourth thing that happened in Peter's uh, structure of his sermon? Peter presents the undeniable fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead by his father. Something these people witnessed, by the way. This is the second time Peter has made this statement. He seems as though virtually everyone in the city in Jerusalem had witnessed Jesus alive after the cross. He's specifically thinking, you probably heard about it, right? These are essential for the gospel message. Guys, these, this, what he just did in the fourth point is the bare bones, just bare naked structure of presenting the gospel. Here it is. Jesus is God in the flesh. He died, though he had no sin, and the Father raised him from the dead. You guys ask me, what, well, how do you share the gospel? There it is, three. There's the story. Three things. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's incarnate. He died, though he had no sin, and fa the Father raised him from the dead. And then fifth, the last thing Peter says, he calls upon the crowd, to do something about it. He says the lame man is walking because of faith in Jesus' name. In Greek, in verse 16, it's difficult to parse since the verse is a complicated sentence. The sentence actually begins back in verse 13. I told you it was going to be Greek heavy today. How Here's how it reads most literally in your English Bible. <clears throat> Acts 3.16 and on the faith of his name, this one whom you see and have known, his name made strong, even the faith that through him did give him to this perfect soundness before you all. That's the English translation. If we replace the pronouns, we can make it a little easier to follow. So watch this. And on the faith of Jesus' name, this lame man who you see and have known, Jesus', Jesus name made him strong, even the faith that through Jesus did give to the lame man this perfect soundness before you all. <laughs> so this is the English literal translation of English to Greek. So the NET Bible renders the text in a very reasonable way. Let me read it. And on the basis, listen real quick, and on the basis of faith in Jesus' name, his very name has made this man whom you see and know, strong. The faith that is through Jesus has given him this complete health in the presence of you all. That's how Eng that's the, the strongest English translation we can come up with to match Greek. Clearly, Peter is crediting faith in Jesus as the means of his healing. The lame man was healed by faith in the name of Jesus, yet consider that the man himself never received the gospel preaching from Peter. Peter simply commanded him to walk in the name of Jesus. How are we supposed, are we supposed to, how are we supposed that this man's faith entered into the process? Did he already have faith in Jesus? This is probably the only likely explanation that I can come up with. Perhaps Jesus gave Peter the awareness to heal the man because the man had already shown faith in Jesus. But look again at Peter's statement, especially in the NET. Peter says that a faith in the name of Jesus is the authority in the authority of Jesus made the man's body strong. 
And the faith itself, Peter says, is through Jesus. The NIV actually renders it the faith that comes through him. The faith that saves is a faith that comes to us through Jesus. Not by nature, not by a good sermon, not by a nice church, not by anything, but Jesus himself. Through is the word dia in Greek, and it simply means because of. So whenever I say faith through Jesus, it's faith because of Jesus. You, my friend, if you're listening to me right now, are a miracle because Jesus said you are. You are saved because Jesus said you are. That's insane insane to me. And on the basis of faith in that name, this man was healed. The emphasis on through is very important in understanding what happened in that moment. The gift of faith, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, was delivered to this man so that he might be healed. Say that one more time. The gift of faith was delivered to this man so that he might be healed. And the story is the same with you. I'm going to read the last section of Scripture, and then we're done. We have three minutes, according to my clock. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that is, his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven was must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses actually said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren to him who you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet shall be utterly destroyed and, and from among the people. And likewise, all the prophet who has spoken... Who has spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Peter acknowledges that the Jews of the city were ignorant of what they were doing. He did. He did acknowledge that and didn't realize the man that they were killing was the Messiah. Unlike many within the leadership of Israel who were not innocent this, in this way. And the entire episode was according to prophecy. He's saying he absolutely, we, you guys absolutely missed it. But place your faith in Christ now. It's an interesting thing if you guys see this and then I'm done. The entire episode was recorded according to prophecy but there's something interesting in verse 19. Look at verse 19 real quick. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins. See that? It, there's a word for repent in verse 19 that's actually plural in Greek. In Texas, in the South, when I lived in Arkansas, you used the word y'all. That's what he's saying right there. Peter is calling for the collective group to repent. The whole nation. Peter says this repentance would result in the Father sending Jesus back for us right now. But Jesus has already been sent, right? No, he's saying the second coming. We could do this right now, Peter said. Finally, Peter says that Moses among the prophets told Israel that God would raise up a prophet, and they did, he did, and they crucified him. We crucified him, I should say. Putting this all together, we see Peter is preaching too close linked messages simultaneously. Peter is making a call for personal salvation. And their second thing, there's a coming kingdom outlined in Zechariah 12. The return of Jesus is imminent, everybody. But they really thought it was imminent right here. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad, A, we have this record? And aren't you glad... B, that he's tarried, and that he saw you 
in your helplessness, in your sin. And he said, I'm going to change your name. I'm going to adopt you. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to raise you up as my own. I'm going to outfit you with all the, the family jewels. And I'm going to change your future forever. That's our God. That's the God that we serve. Now, if you guys want to check out the reflection questions, I, I invite you to do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, go ahead. Can you can I borrow that real quick? I don't have my little piece of paper. I'm gonna read these just so those on the podcast can hear. But number one, teaching, fellowship, communion, prayer. How am I doing in these areas in my personal devotion to God? Number two. Am I continuously devoted to receiving God's word? Well, you did it today. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Number three, am I spending time in fellowship with other believers? Four, am I participating in communion and prayer? Five, when it comes to generosity, being rich, is it easier to meet felt needs or spread the message of the gospel? And then last, how about how are you doing in the spiritual gift area? Am I using my spiritual gift correctly? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. I don't know how to say thanks. Thanks isn't a real great word. It's gratitude, I guess. It's a it's a posture of of un, unmerited mercy and grace that you've poured out on us, us today. I do. I, I pray. I pray for a revelation as even as the day goes on, that as we just get loaded up with this information, it would just des descend into our soul and prove a new outlook. Just like the apostles, just like the first church, those three thousand, they got a new vocational dedication, a new devotion. I pray that over my brothers and sisters right now, that we would be so generous with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that our minds will literally <laughs> won't be able to comprehend what's happening in front of us watching you move. Thank you for that. Thank you for being the leader of the dance and us just grabbing on, holding on for dear life. It's a wonder to watch you work. We're here for, we're here for the mission. We're here reporting for duty. And we thank you for what you've done in this place in the last 60 minutes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow, guys. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Let's see if I can even... Uh, yeah, here we go. Screen